Um, so next speaker is uh, Bastian Kaisake Tsuvaras, and um, he'll speak about personal data, its reuse, and community-driven research. Yes. Okay. Hey, everyone. I want to talk about a bit of a different topic today, which is personal data. And personal data use somehow. It's not loud enough. It's not loud enough. Mm -hmm. Let's see, better like this. Yeah. yeah, getting there. So, personal data use, which is a bit of an icky topic these days, especially because usually when we think about personal data, what we have in mind is a big number of people who give away their data to things like this. So we have like Facebook, all these social networks, and they have data and they have lots of money. And what happens is that shady things like this somehow happen. So data is being siphoned off, it's being sold. And we all know what happens then. So 87 million people lose their data to Cambridge Analytica. And the outcome somehow is not so nice for society at large, I would say. So we have like the psychological warfare tools which come out of it. And even if Cambridge Analytica closes down now, they have already announced, basically, they have found a new company, 2020, they are there again. We we'll manipulate our democracy once again. And I think many of us might say, well, we in academia, we are different, right? We are doing a better job, we are not evil. But let's check. So there's two possible scenarios. The first is that we as researchers are actually not so different. So we basically do the same thing. We go to Facebook and siphon off their data, either as a collaboration, or because we just scraped the data. And the research that comes out of it is not necessarily much more friendly when it comes to ethics somehow. So two examples. On the bottom one, we have the Facebook mood experiment, where they basically manipulated around 700,000 people's timelines to influence their mood and behavior by just changing what they display to see whether they can. And yes, they can influence how people feel. And I think last year was the one on top. The gay face AI thing where they basically just trained an artificial intelligence to predict people's sexual orientation based on their fa Facebook profile pictures, which people were also not super happy about somehow. And if you think, well, this is all with collaborations with Facebook, it's already bad enough. It's even worse because people can just scrape public websites somehow or just make a fake account and just scrape data and then say, we are all for open data, let's publish all the data we scrape. So 70,000 people had their OkCupid profiles, a dating website made publicly available because it's, it's open data, it's good for science. So also not necessarily what we want. The a bit easier thing is that instead of going through Facebook and other big social media, social network sites, as we go as a researcher directly to our participants and ask them to donate data to us, which is much nicer, we think, and it's also working out better. But even this is not a guarantee for actually achieving what we would like to see, because we are maybe not actually studying what our research participants would like us to study. One big example of this is the diabetes community where basically people are having now their own hashtag, we are not waiting, because they are not waiting any longer for scientists to actually study what they would like to have studied, being patients. So they start doing their, their do-it-yourself hacks, they develop their own hardware, their own software to manage their own disease, because we as researchers are failing them. And similarly, another thing, given that it's Pride Month, is the unique healthcare needs of LGBTQ people, which somehow also academic research for a very long time has not really taken good care of. And to stay at the LGBTQ community for a while, because they have a very good interest in this and a good lobby, is that they basically are saying, well, if you are trying to study us, you really need to somehow talk to us. So you, first of all, you need to somehow demonstrate that you have good intentions and yet you are competent in studying us as, as a vulnerable population. And also, you need to involve us from the start, basically. So just doing research on us without talking to us doesn't really work. So to sum it up, the problems of traditional approaches to personal data and research is that it's often unclear when it comes to consent when the data comes from Facebook and so on. And our participants usually are very passive. We are not involving them in designing the research. We just use them as like data sources. So the question is, how can we get some involvement of our participants in doing research, also as bioinformaticians? And 
The idea is that we have to flip the table, or rather we have to flip the script. So instead of thinking about we as the researchers should be at the center of all of it, we need to do participant-centered or even better participant-led research. And this idea is not really super new. Oops. So we have these researchers who now not only go to like the community, but also the community talks back to people to somehow figure out what they actually should study. And as I said, the idea is not super new, so it's been around for a good while that research led by participants can actually make a new kind of research. And the idea is that participants are often involved in designing a project and study because they are the domain experts themselves, like in the case of diabetes, and they have a much better idea of giving consent if you actually are involved in the study, you can decide what you would like to do. So the big question is how can we do this at scale on the web? And We've heard a lot about already about using APIs, and yes, APIs are a great way to connect not only data sources, but also people. People with researchers, people with projects, and all of these things to do stuff at scale. And that's where Open Humans, where I'm working on, comes in. And the idea is that we just can facilitate on the web these interactions. So what we have is basically people sign up to Open Humans on our website, create an account, and now this is their one stop, basically, where they can interact with scientific experiments. And scientific experiments can be all kinds of different projects. So people can connect to a project, project A, and project A wants to get data from a participant. So they just start a very regular interaction through OAuth and just negotiate which permissions to give. So project A would like to upload some files into your Open Humans account. It wants to see your username. It might want to message you somehow. And now our user here in the bottom can say, sure, I'm happy to do this. They like, give the connection. This user can now get their data uploaded into their account, and it's all good. Then we can have project B, on the other hand, which does the same thing. They want to upload files as well. They want to read files from the other project even, so there's like interoperability between files, and you can share them between projects. And what you might also see, this, this project is not even asking for a username. So the whole thing is also set up that it can be de-identified. Each project then in that case just gets like a random identifier and sends mes messages through the system without actually seeing who it is. And then here we have project C, does the same thing, wants to see data from project A, project B, message you, and that's it. And what's nice here is that projects basically have the big benefit of who actually can run them, because projects not only can be run by academic researchers like Project B, but every one of you basically as an individual without any funding or any like academic support can just run a project. You make a project on the Open Humans website, it's just a couple of clicks, set it up, and now people can basically join your study, your project, and you can ask them for permission to see data. So how does it work in practice? I wanted to give some examples of what we already have on the Open Humans platform. So one example coming to academic research is the use of activity trackers. I think most of us here in the room somehow have like either an Apple Watch, have like a smartphone that tracks your steps or have like a Fitbit, whatever. And Open Humans has lots of different data sources that support activity tracking data. So your Apple Watch, your Jawbone, if you're very old fashioned, your Fitbit, your GPS tracks from Moves, RunKeeper, and so on. You can all connect it to your Open Humans account and will continuously basically update your Open Humans account with your latest activity tracking data. <coughs> and now you can make up a study that asks permission to see this data. And Ruby Chunara at NYU actually did this because she's interested in studying how our movement patterns change during the seasons. So basically as well, if it's winter, are we moving less more or less? And so now Rumi can go to individual people and say, well, could I see your Fitbit data, for example? And if our participant chooses to share, Rumi gets access to it, and around 350 people have done so. So Rumi now, in a very easy way, with just like asking for permission and going to existing community, gets access to all of this data. A second example that's more genomics focused and that's not academic, at least, is uh, this one, so genome exploration. You can also upload your genome into Open Human. So if you have a 23andMe test done, if you, for whatever reason you have a VCF of your exome, your genome, you can upload it into Open Humans. If you're a member of the Personal Genome Project, connect to Open Humans and the data is there as well. And we have a project called Genoweave, which is a personal genome annotation tool. So it uses ClinWa basically to annotate your individual genome, and you can explore your genome and learn more about yourself. 
It's run by the person who is now the executive director of Open Humans, but it was done as a purely private hobby project. So whoever has like an idea to use data can do it. People sign up and are playing around with it. And to come back to a community research project in diabetes, we also have a big diabetes community on Open Humans. So people who are saying they are not waiting anymore, led by Dana Lewis, one of our big members, basically decided to hack into their own continuous glucose monitor and siphon off all of their personal data. They're uploading it into Open Humans through the Night Scout data transfer and then shared in different data commons. So to give you an idea whether people are doing this, some numbers. So we have 5,000 people doing it already. 2,000 of them have data shared, 15,000 data files, and 26 projects currently running. When it comes to data sources, we have a highly diverse set of data sources. So we have genetic data, activity tracking data, people sharing GPS tracks there, Wi-Fi scale data, blood glucose level, and even social media data. So if you are a big Twitter user, you can share your complete Twitter archive with us. And it's kind of easy to see how this way of like individual projects asking for very targeted access to your data can improve the consenting issue. But it also improves the whole process of actually involving people earlier because every data source can be added by anyone. So if you have an idea for a data source that should be added to open humans, you can just make one up. And adding new data sources, it works right away. So it's like you can just make the project, people can donate data, but there's an approval pro process in place. So the first 40 people can sign up into your project right away, but after that there's a user cap and you need to get approval for it. And this we are currently experimenting with us doing it in a community process. So you basically ask permission to the community. The community votes on whether they want to approve your project, yes or no, in a way that people can talk to each other. So they can say, well, I might approve your project, but there's a couple of issues that you need to solve first. So that's what we are working around right now. And to sum it up, this individual-centric personal data sharing is APIs are a great way to getting individuals to truly consent to individual parts of your study, and it can turn passive participants into active agents of your scientific research. It can reduce the friction because it's making people getting started much easier, and also governance structures you can experiment around. But what else can we do with our personal data once we aggregate it? That is, we can use personal data notebooks. So we have heard the keynote this morning about basically experimenting with like data in your browser, but you can now do this also using the personal data. And what the personal data notebooks are is basically a Jupyter hub that connects into Open Humans. So what you do is you just sign in with your Open Humans account, and then you see a list of your notebooks. You can open notebooks, and, and in each notebook then, what you will have is like a list of all of your files that you have connected into your Open Humans account. So it's basically all these lines of Python is what you need to see all the data that you have in your Open Humans account and you can get started right away. And this is really fun because this allows you to now correlate data sources with each other, which you maybe might not be able to do otherwise. So if you have your Fitbit data, you have your Twitter data, your genetic data, all of this is now in one place in your browser and you can just play around with it. Like some tiny examples is like, well, do my step counts drop when it's cold or rainy outside? If you have the data sources linked up to Open Humans, you can just write a notebook or find a notebook that other people have written, and it just works, and you can see whether it does or not. Similarly, does my daily workload influence how much I walk? Also now becomes possible to just like use a notebook and you are done. And the question is, where can we find such notebooks? And we've built a nice tool that is basically a notebook exploratory, where people share notebooks, and it's a one-click solution for running notebooks on your personal data. So this is how it looks like. It lists all the notebooks which are publicly shared along with text and data sources you need for interfacing with them. You can have a look what you like and then basically what you have when you just like select one, click on it. You can even see some comments. You can see the notebook as a preview. And now you see there's the button open personal data notebook. If you click on this, it will just open it in your personal data notebook in the Jupyter Hub. So it's just like really a very simple thing. This is the notebook. You just press the run button and run on your personal data. So you can see the example of how it looked like for another person first. And if you run it now, it will basically tell you what my eye color is based on my genome by just clicking this one button. So that's pretty easy to do and a lot of fun. And the question is, can we now also share these notebooks easily? 
And yes, that's basically a one-click solution as well. So you just, in a given notebook that you have written, you press the button, upload to open humans, you annotate it with like a bit of metadata, and then it's publicly available for other people on the page you saw before. They can click the button as well at once on their data. So to sum it up, it's these notebook-based data exploration is really fun because it allows for reproducible end of one data analysis in your browser. You don't need to mess around with any modules or anything. It's really easy. You can share these analysis with other people and keep your personal data private because you just share the notebook and not any of the data. And it's a lot of fun. So big thanks go to Tim Head, whom we've seen in the keynote this morning a couple of times who helped us in setting all of this up. And if you want to see more of the notebooks and play around with, your, with it for yourself, drop by later at the demos. Talk to me, and we can play around with my data as an example. And that's, thanks. <laughs>